Welcome, George. Thank you so much Thanks. for being here. Thanks very much. Um, and we are so looking forward to you. So you know um, a little bit about me, but I'd just like to find out um, how many of you actually have ever watched the news on the BBC? Oh, it's pretty That's good. That's not bad. That's not bad. So how many of you have ever watched the news at six, which is a program I do? Okay. And your parents, what do they watch? Also. So, um, so you know a little bit about me. I've worked for the BBC. I've presented news at six. I've been doing that for, I think, um, about 14 years or something. A very, very long time. And I've been working for the BBC for about 30 years. And before that, I worked for a magazine for about 10 years. So I've been doing this kind of stuff, journalism, for a very long time. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about me a little, in more detail. Um, but I'd quite like to find out about you guys. So tell me um, a little bit about yourself. I'll just go anyone who fancies telling me. I mean, are you kind of here because you're really brainy people? Or are you here because you're all sort of, I don't know, posh or what? <laughs> you know, so who wants to have a go at telling you who you are? Yeah. Um, my name's Michael. I'm 17. I'm in year th well, I'm going into year 13, studying maths, further maths, economics, and computer science. And I hope to do computer science in a university. Um, I don't know which university yet, I saw, but yeah, that's me. that's my plan as far as education goes. Okay. And where does your family come from? Um, well, they they came from Ghana, so we. So live I here. thought so. I recognise the accent. You'll see why I'm saying that. Okay. Okay, from yeah. Ghana. But you were born here? Yeah, I was. Anybody else want to tell me who you are or what you're doing? Yeah. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm 14. I'm from Sri Lanka as well. Are you? Yeah. Oh. And um, I'm going into year 10, so I've got my GCSEs in two, year, two years. And I'm doing um, three sciences, two English, maths, geography, um, PRE, which is philosophy, religion, and ethics. And I'm doing computer science in 20 years. So when I say that you brainy people, I mean you basically are, aren't you? So what, what about, just tell me about this, this kind of gathering, what's this about? So this is an AI accelerator Can they tell me? for teenagers. Yes, no, okay. you go. We'll yeah, why don't you tell me? What are you doing here? No, I've heard from you, Michael. Yeah, what about you? Um, so this is like teams and AI. So AI meaning, is what's that, artificial intelligence? Yeah, artificial intelligence. You've got to treat me like a five-year-old. Um, so we're all like... Like in our separate groups, all like kind of tackle like a problem and like create a solution to it using artificial intelligence. So, right. yeah. So, so have you, have you done what have you what projects have you done you know, like today? Uh, well, my group we're like tackling like climate change and also like lack of physical activity in London. So we're like creating an app for that. Brilliant. Okay, so that really helps me. Um, and it helps me, well, you obviously are high flyers, what we call high flyers, um, and, I, and I hope you get where you're going to. And I want to tell you a little bit about how I got to where I am at the moment, which is, as I was saying, I, BBC News at Six is the programme that is, it's the most watched news programme in Britain. So more people watch that than any other news programme. So it's quite a big programme. And obviously you can imagine every day, just about I get, um, what led me to become a reporter? At about, um, I can't remember exactly the age, but I think it was about 14, 15, I read a book, which is, I don't know, it might be in print still. Uh, it's, it's called The Grapes of Wrath by a guy called John Steinbeck. Anyone know? Seen it? And um, it's about a family called the Jodes, if I remember rightly. And um, they're white people uh, in, Oklahoma, the Okies they're called, and it was in the 1930s and there was a terrible depression in America and there were farmers and there was a drought, there was what was called a dust bowl because literally their farming land just ended up floating around in the air in, in dust and they make this amazing journey down Route 66 which is a road I want to travel. Um, so these are still things, as I said, you know, there are still achievements to do and I want to do that road. Um, they go down to California and it's a story of that and and, and how along the way so many people were unjust to them. And I think that book had, a, had an impression on me. I kind of felt um, that I wanted to be, to voice, be the voice for people like that. Okay, it's a very high ideal and I'm not sure I've achieved it. Sometimes I did um, in places like um, 
you know, Sierra Leone, it's Rwanda, and so on. I have talked about it. But that was my ideal. I wanted, I, I felt very strongly after that book. And then, then I began to see it, hear stories about my own history and what had happened to Tamil people. And you sort of think, well, there's lots of ways of doing this, by the way. You know, you can, you know, you can use all this maths and extra maths and all the other things that Mike was talking about. Pick, you know, start, you know, create a startup, make loads of money, go and spend it in Ghana, and create opportunities for people. So there's lots of ways. You can, you can give people voice in many, many different ways. I felt the one thing, way I could give people their voice was to become a reporter, to become a journalist, to be the person who would listen to them and then relay their stories. Um, to, uh, to other people. Yeah. How do you feel AI can change the world? How do I feel AI can change the world? See, so now you've got me here because I'm so bloody old that I don't even know exactly what AI can do. So what I've done is to um, read a little bit about it. And have you read a book by a guy called Yoval Hariri? Um, I think he's called. He's an Israeli professor. On the recommended list. Yeah. So he wrote a book called Sapiens. He read a second book and a third book, which is one I've read. is something like um, 21 oh, Questions for the 21st century. century. And he, t he talks about that. And he's quite interesting. <coughs> Firstly, artificial intelligence, as you guys know, because you're brainier than me on this, um, is here to stay. Um, and we haven't seen anything yet. It's going to get you know, more and more things are going to happen, artificial intelligence is going to take over things. But what's really, really important, and those of you who are looking at artificial intelligence, is to work out what is it that makes us human. Big deal. So you get a robot to come and, I don't know, make tea, to make a bed, to build a car, build a plane, take us to space, work out how healthy we are, how healthy we're not. You're still left with this question, what is it that makes us who we are? What is it that makes us special? Um, where does AI come in when you care for someone? Where does AI come in when you want to love someone? Where does AI come in when you want to hate someone? There's still a whole lot of things that only we humans can do. So I'm quite excited by the prospect. I do a lot of driving. Um, I can't wait to have some robot take me around. You know, I just took an Uber here, and the guy got lost. Can you believe it? Between Stone Hackney and here, he got lost. You know, the robots are never going to do that. It's going to drop me off here in good shape, good time. So I can't wait to have robots do all that sort of shitty work for me. Um, what I'd really like is for a robot to leave what it is I can do as a human. Leave that to me. Um, and I think there's a lot of things we can develop. And you know, I mentioned this guy, Hariri, and one of the things he says is, we have to ask ourselves, as robots are doing so much, what do we do with our time? And that's a really interesting question because we could spend more time uh, living in a community, we could take more time taking care of our planet, we can uh, spend more time with our families. Um, there's lots of creative stuff we could do um, with, with, uh, as long, when the AI really gets going. I don't think they'll ever be able to do my job though, do you? Do you think it, a robot could do that? I think there is already um, an AI robot <laughs> an anchor that can really? do that. Really? Oh, yes. Rubbish. Oh, <laughs> that, that was like... good. <laughs> you, that was good. But apparently it's been, actually, it's been done somewhere. I'll, t I'll, take, I'll take it off. In China. Yeah. yeah. I think it's in China. Or in China, yeah. China. Yeah, in China. Okay. Okay. There's the AI robot. I don't know how much time you've got, but I'm happy to take it. Yes. Yeah. Did you ever get nervous before presenting the news? I get nervous every day. I mean, I'm not saying that I get like properly nervous and I can't open my mouth, obviously. Um, there's two types of nervousness that uh, I think you will come across in your lives. There's the adrenaline burst, um, what do they call it? Um, flight, fear or flight or something like that. Um, right, right. And as the clock ticks over in my ear, I hear 10 seconds, 5 seconds, 3, 4, 3, and then they stop counting. And that's a bit I hate. There's three seconds where they don't count because they're frightened that will make it on air. And it's like, oh my god, I'm on the dark side of the moon. You know, what's happened? Have they, <laughs> is there, have I lost, lost what we call it the gallery, the people who sit yeah, in, in, the, in the kind of engineering room? 
Uh, so yeah, there's that kind of nervousness, and I think that's quite good nervousness. It gets me going. It makes sure that um, I'm on my game uh, because when you've done it for as long as I have, it's very easy to think uh, it's going to be another good day. And um, almost, you know, I, people say in, in a job like mine, you get, and, and it will be whether you're a doctor or a software engineer or an AI inventor, whatever. Actually, when you get paid, you're get, getting paid for the days when things go wrong, because that's when this thing has got to start working. Um, so that kind of adrenaline-based nervousness, good, I get that. Um, there have been times in my career where I've just been frightened. Um, in, in a war zone, I've been held up at gunpoint um, by soldiers, sometimes child soldiers, very difficult to deal with, you know, they're children. Um, it's very difficult to have a rational thing. They've been drugged, often that kind of thing. So yes, I've been, I've been scared and uh, you've just got to work through that and, and, and try and deal with it as best you, best you can. Yeah. Uh, what was your um, hardest moment in your career? The hardest moment? Um, Well, there were lots of stories that I did were, uh, as I said, were, were in, in difficult circumstances. And the hardest thing for me to do was to make sure that I didn't reduce these people just to like numbers. You know, a million, 800 Tutsis were killed in the Rwandan genocide. How do you get that across? Because nobody knows what 800,000 looks like. I don't know what 800, I mean, I kind of know what. 70,000 looks like 80,000 because you think of the Emirates Stadium or something and you think, okay, but 800,000, what does that look like? Um, so the hardest challenge I had, if I can put it that way, is how in two, two and a half minutes of television time can you portray people with the dignity they deserve because if, if they've been victims, they may, they, you know, um, in Somalia, for example, where there was a famine, I, mean, I saw people looking literally like sticks put together with a bit of skin on it. How do, you, how do you retain their dignity, their humanity? And I think that was always a challenge. I'm not sure that I always got it right, but I certainly tried to, to do that. Yeah? Did your race ever hold you back in your professional career? Did my race ever hold me back? Um, I don't think it did. Um, although it has been a factor. I think throughout my life, um, or at least the, since I came to England, I was very aware that I, just, I wasn't just George Allagaya, I was George Allagaya the brown kid. So in school, I always felt that if I failed, people would think brown people failed and then it's stupid or whatever and if I succeeded I was doing it as a brown kid so race was a factor throughout my life I mean, I'm not letting it become the dominant thing I told myself um, I, I mentioned to you that being teased very early on literally within two days of coming to this country you know imagine it I was um, 11 I left a home where we had chickens in the yard a mango tree a pineapple bush a papaya tree my parents, a dog, uh, even had a pet monkey, and suddenly I'm in a, in a, in a city um, school in, in Portsmouth, and I, I start getting teased. So I think I made, made, told myself in those first few weeks that I wasn't gonna let race define me. Um, so I think I've been aware of it, um, and I think it is an impediment to many, many people. Race is a problem still in our country. Um, uh, whether it's racism, which is that people look at you and say, hey, Michael, you're black, you're not going to get on. I don't, I'm not sure that that happens very often, uh, but it is a kind of factor. And, and many of you, because you're the same color as me, or whatever, are going to have to deal with that. Um, and just back yourself. You're as good as anybody. Okay. I have one question. So um, you mentioned something that I found very important, that we have to look behind what we see. Yeah. Um, how do you think AI, in general, 
we can help young people that may have a limited experience of life to look behind what they see, to um, have this critical thinking about what they get from social media maybe, because it's the most like, um, maybe they can tell more, is the most media channel they use. Um, what advice you can give them? Well, I'm always, I'm, I'm tempted to ask you for and the ask. answer. <laughs> I'm tempted to ask you for the answer. You probably know more than me about that, because you know more about what AI can do. Um, and this, just, just um, I'm, I'm sorry, if, I'm not wanting to be offensive, but you know, some people will look at you with your veil and yeah. so on, yeah. and they will make an assumption about who yeah. you are. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's really what we're talking about. Let's let's not talk about it like an airy fairy thing. Yes. It's a real thing. So they'll look at you and say, mm, "Yeah, Muslim. Mm, yeah. yeah. What, what does that mean? You know, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Exactly. And I know, especially in my profession, there are lots of journalists say, "Oh, a Muslim person must be, you know, involved in something dodgy, kind of thing." Or well, black person, no, obviously carrying a knife. You know, there's all these kind of stereotypes and so exactly. on. You know, so that's why I told you about those soldiers. Mm -hmm. I think they're good people. You may disagree with me. I don't know. Your parents might, you know, from Afghanistan or Uzbekistan might not like it. I thought they were good people because I'd seen them properly. I'd listened to them. So AI, uh, what we're talking about here, isn't it? If I look at you and I, I make assumptions, what I need is an education. I need to be educated about Islam and why it is a great religion um, and why it is a peaceful religion. I can tell you something. When I, um, as a reporter, used to travel around the world, um, there are often times when you just need to take a rest. Because sometimes for days on end, you go by from big, big stories, three, four hours of sleep a night, and it can go on for two weeks, or so, often in a tent or something. And um, in places like Somalia, you know, I would, go, I would go to a mosque, and I was always welcomed in. I mean, I guess it might have helped that I was a man, I don't know. But um, uh, helped in for, and just to soak in some of that peacefulness, even in, in time, times of war. So that wasn't part of my education. So I would challenge you, since you were, you know, it's not my generation that's going to do this. Your generation. And that's what I said. Make AI be in the service of humanity. It is only a tool, okay? It's like a screwdriver. You know, whoever the woman was, or the man, I don't know, who invented the screwdriver was doing actually something as amazing as coming up with AI. Because before the screwdriver, what were they doing? They were going like this. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said, oh no, if we do this, maybe it's a bit easier and we get a, get a, get a tougher joint. So, so the, way, the way around that is to make AI be in the service of humanity, to help people see, see through the stereotypes, see through the screen, see through all of those things, the hate that you see on Twitter, all that kind of rubbish. Um, that would be a good thing. Yes. Have there been any times in your career where there's been positive discrimination? Um, so I don't know. Um, it, I mean, I can't speak for other people, but it, in my case, it, it might have been, been that. I was the first um, black foreign correspondent, full-time foreign correspondent the BBC had. And, you know, I went to this interview. There were four white men, um, <clears throat> and I was the only not a white person there, and I don't know whether they, they um, looked at me and said, oh, maybe we need, need someone like this in there. Um, the interesting thing about your question, what's your name? Rachel. Rachel. I've got a sister called Rachel. Um, the interesting thing about your question, Rachel, is, if I can put it this way, is positive discrimination a good thing? Okay. And that, I did a program on this years ago. Um, and in some countries, America is a classic example, we don't do it here yet, and we may not, is the way they decide to help people who are disadvantaged, whether they're women, whether they're disabled, whether they're black, white, or whatever, is to have quotas. So say we were all in a company, all of us, and they'd say, okay, we haven't got enough women, so let's have 30 women, you know, one in every, one in every three people has got to be, be a woman. So that's a quota. Now, I did a program on this, and I came to the conclusion that quotas, just, just taking a group of people and doing a number, wasn't a good thing. Because kind of what happened was, you just ended up trying to fill in that number, and you weren't necessarily getting the most talented people. So all you needed to do is go to your boss and say, hey, guess what, man, three, three out of my ten people in my 
department are all, all, all black. Tick. I get a promotion, I get paid. It didn't tell you about how good those people were. Um, positive discrimination, which is the, 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 the phrase you've used, and I, I, don't even, I, I sort of don't like a bit of the discrimination bit of it, but I hear what you're saying, Rachel, is why not? What's so wrong with taking people who've got talent when you see it and then just moving them along a bit faster than you would otherwise? I think that's important because I think it is important to have people like me in the jobs uh, that I do. And I still get people writing to me who grew up with me as a first correspondent of colour um, and, and saying, you inspired me to go and do, do something. Um, so I think it is important to get, get people from minorities or whatever into positions where they can be seen, but you need to get the right people. So talent still matters. I mean, that's what I'm saying, really. And I think positive discrimination, to use your phrase, is more likely to get you there than simply playing the numbers game, which is what the quota system um, will do. And affirm the affirmative action program, and look it up um, in, um, in America, it was called affirmative action, it was laws passed. It's all really about numbers. And I don't think, you know, you've still got incredibly poor black people. In fact, some people argue that the quota system in America created an underclass, because what it did was take middle class black people, they got the jobs to fill in the quotas, and everybody else got left behind and just forgotten. Go to Southside Chicago, go to Jackson, you know, places like that where we've had some of the some of the shootings and so on. I've exhausted you. Good. <laughs> right. Any more questions? Oh, perfect. So thank you so much.